So in the spring of 1978, I was in uh, northern Maine at Loring Air Force Base specifically, uh, just starting my Air Force uh, post-basic training, post-security training uh, career. I had a small Konica C-35 uh, rangefinder, but I was looking to uh, buy an SLR. I had had an SLR, I think, since I was 13 or 14 years old, uh, one that I bought with my uh, Christmas paper paper route tips, but I no longer had that camera. And uh, to be quite truthful, I was looking really to move up to something that was just better. I was now 18 years old, so I was pretty sure that I knew more than most people <laughs> about everything, uh, because I think that's how you sort of approach things when you're when you're uh, young and whatever arrogant. All right, back to photography. So this was one of the cameras I was considering, the Minolta XD11. What made this camera so great was that it was the first multi-mode single lens reflex camera um, on the market, or at least available from a major uh, ma Japanese manufacturer. So with this camera, you could either shoot um, you could either shoot shutter priority, aperture priority, or fully manual. It had a very soft touch uh, shutter release, and you you had your shutter speed dial up here. This particular camera has the uh, shorter uh, 45 millimeter f 2.0 lens, uh, it, and you can see it is a shorter profile lens. It's a pretty good lens. Most of them, of course, came with like that 50 1.7 uh, Rokor, Rokor X by that time. Uh, MD was the lens mount. Um, I can't recall what the lens mount, I th oh, it was MC. They were calling it a, a Celtic, or Celtic. In addition to being a multi-mode, it was a fully featured camera. You know, it had a rapid return mirror, it had open aperture uh, uh, um, metering. It also had a self-timer, as you can see. Uh, you could do exposure compensation, and this is where you would change your film speeds. This was your depth of field preview lever in which you could stop down the lens and presumably get an idea of what would be in focus and what would not be in focus. I actually have never found those to be that useful because it darkens the viewfinder so much that it is, it's sort of difficult to see. On the side, we have our synchronization socket for a, an off-camera flash, and up here you have your traditional hot shoe. You'll notice an extra pin, and that means that there was a dedicated, dedicated flash unit made specifically for this camera, and very likely it set the uh, uh, shutter to 1 30th of a second. You'll notice on this dial, 1 30th is slightly yellow, so that would indicate that that was your flash uh, synchronization speed. It had a little lever here that would close, that would put a blind down over the viewfinder. And the purpose of that would be is if you were shooting this camera on a tripod and you weren't um, peering through the viewfinder as you release the shutter, you would close this blind to avoid any sunlight coming in or any light coming in through the eyepiece and then influencing the meter, the light meter. This most assuredly used the silicon blue cell for metering. I would have to look that up, but I'm pretty, I'm fairly certain it was. Uh, by that time, uh, camera makers were really moving away as quickly as as quickly as possible from the cadmium sulfide cell that was uh, used for pretty much most of the 60s on into the early 70s. On the base plate, you had a coupling for either. I don't know if they had a motor drive. They probably did, uh, but for an auto winder, here's your battery chamber cover, and the batteries used are going to be a very common silver oxide S76. I think they're also sold as 365, perhaps, um, and or LR44, uh, which is uh, lithium, and uh, always use either a silver oxide or a lithium battery, and never um, alkaline if possible. Uh, your tripod socket was in alignment with the center, center of the lens. This is your rewind uh, post. It's a press and release, so you just press it, it stays down. And then you can rewind your film with a crank, with a fold out crank, which of course was very common by that time. It was a feature that seemed to be uh, popular, possibly introduced and certainly popularized by uh, Japanese uh, camera makers. A much welcome um, 
uh, change from the traditional knob rewind. This small button allows you to change your uh, film speed. You'll notice that this one's marked in ASA. This camera was marketed, I thought, in Europe as the XG7. However, if I'm wrong, I'll make note of it down here. This had a single stroke film advance, which meant that you really had to advance the film in one stroke. You couldn't do it in increments. So if you partially advance it here and let go of the crank, it would return to its position, but you still had to push it all the way forward to fully tension the shutter. This had shutter speeds running from one one thousandth of a second down to one second, plus X for flash synchronization, B, and zero. Zero didn't actually mean zero. That was a manual shutter speed because the shutter was entirely battery dependent. So, and the camera itself was entirely battery dependent. Uh, so no, no battery power, no meter, no shutter actuation, except for the, really the two speeds. I think you could do B and uh, that one speed. Your self-timer is a mechanical self-timer. Inside the camera, while well, you open the back through the traditional method of pulling up on the rewind crank. In the back, you had your usual pressure plate. In fact, this is sort of a longer uh, pressure plate, pretty much running the entire width of this, uh, <laughs> the film rails. So the purpose of the pressure plate, of course, is to keep the film flat against the film rails so that when you take your photograph, it will uh, the film will be flat across the film plane and you will get as sharp as photo as possible. Of course, that was always dependent on the, uh, the lens being able to record a sharp image. This is your take-up spool. If you notice, uh, part of the take-up spool has broken away. The only way to replace this, of course, is to get a donor camera at this point. And now you have two cameras, but let's not go down that road today. Uh, film runs traditionally from left to right. And it rewinds in the opposite manner. So when you do uh, put film into this camera, just drop in your canister here, your fresh, fresh film here. You would insert the leader partially under here. And you'll notice actually there's a little tiny nub. You can see it right there. And that catches the uh, sprocket in the film. And so as you wind the film, the emulsion is on the outside. And that was very common among many cameras. Once it's caught, close the back, fire off two blanks, and your next one, you'll be at, you should be at frame one. Yes, no, I'm at frame one. So your frame counter is here. You're gonna see this little indicator, little circle with a slash through it. That is the film plane. And this was often uh, imprinted on many cameras, and I think that was for scientific purposes. Uh, for example, if you weren't able to look through the viewfinder, you would know precisely where the film plane was, because if you were trying to do very precise measurements, you would know exactly where the film sat inside the camera. I don't ever recall using it, and I really don't know any photographers who ever used that. However, uh, most assuredly, there probably were some who did require that. So, as I mentioned, this was a multi-mode uh, camera, very different from every other camera that was on the market. Most were either aperture priority or shutter priority, and this offered both, and as well as full manual control. So, depending on what you selected, one of these dials had no effect. So, if you had selected aperture priority, turning this dial actually had no effect. What it would do, it would just uh, um, turn off the select. You know, it would turn off sensing any shutter speed dials, and it would use the camera's internal electronics to s set that shutter speed. Conversely, if you were shooting shutter priority, I don't know if you had to put this lens on 16. It's been a while since I used this, or it could be that it just simply ignored whatever this was on. How Let's talk about the viewfinder because the viewfinder in here is unique. So with this viewfinder, fairly large, you had your uh, central spot, you know, with your uh, split image, and you had a collar under here, a little bit coarser. So here's where you would see the aperture. 
And here was where you would see your shutter speed. Now, depending on what mode you were in, you would either see an aperture scale to the right or a shutter speed scale. And it would switch. When you flip, when you flip this switch on the camera, it would move to one or the other. When you, meant to, when you went to manual, it just, when you moved it to manual, it left the shutter speed scale in place. So that in itself was unique. So it would change this scale depending on, as I mentioned, uh, what mode you were in. And so there were small LEDs because that was, you know, how things worked at the time. And the LEDs would indicate either, you know, the shutter speed the camera was selecting or the aperture the camera was selecting. I do have to look this up and see if you have to put this on 16 when you're in shutter speed priority. There was no purely uh, program automatic exposure, and you know that became that continues to be popular today. So it's one or the other, or manual exposure. This camera has a, a what we call standoff position for the lever. You'll see it there. Uh, normally, you just keep it pushed against the body. However, there's no way to lock the shutter release. So. Uh, you know, if you do put it in your bag and something rest, were to rest on top of it, set of keys, hopefully you don't do that. Uh, but let's say a flash unit, uh, whatever, and it depressed the shutter release, it would certainly uh, turn on, activate the meter and run down that battery. And I recall that being noted a number of times in many reviews at the time. However, I'm trying to remember why I didn't end up buying this camera, why I opted for the, um, for the uh, Pentax MX. And I think... It was because simply uh, it was simply because it was a fully electronic camera, and I did want to have that ability to sh continue shooting should the battery uh, ever be exhausted. Of course, I never actually had that situation, so uh, because I, you know I always just checked to make sure the battery was still active. With this camera, however, you would uh, probably always want to carry a second set of batteries just in case. Uh, this is among the downsized uh, SORs, of course, that were made popular first by Olympus. And uh, then other camera makers followed suit. Other Japanese camera makers followed suit. This is a very nice size 35 millimeter camera. Um, the one thing that you'll find that's very common today is that the covering that Olymp or the covering that Minolta used for these cameras has, seems to shrink. And not shrink a little bit, shrink like enough where you often see big gaps. So uh, that was true of this camera. So I just pulled the covering off entirely, and I bought a replacement covering, uh, this uh, faux or fake uh, um, snakeskin. It's really just leather with a self-adhesive uh, um, material. and uh, But it came out very nice. I'm very pleased with how it bonded to the... Uh... So I've shot with this camera. And it, it's very simple to use, and uh, like I said, it's, it's real simple to just switch between um, shutter priority or aperture prior priority. I don't think I've ever used this particular camera on manual exposure. Uh, handling it was very easy. I like the soft the uh, soft touch shutter release. When you have batteries in it, you'll notice that you really don't have to apply much pressure at all to uh, activate the meter. It's not touch sensitive. However, you know, like I said, you don't really need much. Uh, however, I can see the uh, complaint about something accidentally pushing down on it to activate the meter. You do have to remember to put your aperture to f16 or the smallest one, whatever is marked in green on your particular lens. If you move it off of that, well, what it will do is it will actually close down the lens to that particular lens opening. And so then what happens is you're overriding the, um, you're overriding the, uh, the, the metering in the system. By the way, let's take a quick look at the shutter. So this uses a traditional um, vertically traveling metal blade shutter. And so when you tension the shutter, it pulls up on the blades. And when you release it, it drops them down. That's a very common shutter that was in use at that time and continued to be used for uh, 
Oh, heck, probably th even through... I would expect this type of shutter to even be used through the uh, autofocus, auto... Um, auto wind, auto exposure, SLRs of the 90s and early 2000s. And so that wraps up this video. This is the Minolta XD11, a smaller, uh, a smaller 35 millimeter SLR, and the first multi-mode auto exposure single lens reflex camera. These cameras are still available today. However, typically you're gonna find that it has um, uh, one or more problems. Sometimes with the electronics, sometimes with the mechanicals, and often with the body covering. However, if you do find one or, and are able to get it back into working condition, I think that you'll certainly enjoy using it. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video, and if you'd like me to, to cover a particular camera in the future, please let me know in the comments below. Or send me an email at contact at camera-talk.net. And don't forget to hit that like and subscribe button. Until next time, keep on taking photographs.